presentation. I appreciate it. Okay, let's see if this thing works. We're good. Yeah, we have been uh, involved in this now for, I think, about 18 months. Right. So it's been a, been a long road. A lot of things have uh, happened between when we first were contracted to start working with the fire department. A lot of speed bumps in the road, but we're glad to be here tonight. So what I want to do tonight is, uh, first of all, kind of give you a little history of what we have done and then uh, walk you through where we are so we can have a, a picture of what the fire department needs are and several routes that uh, we might go to, to get there and fulfill their needs. So we were originally uh, contracted to do a study which was to not only figure out what you need, but to also to look at the existing facilities, look at the condition, what would, what would not be able to be uh, continued uh, use for the facility. So we inspected the existing facility. Following that, we met with the fire chief and his staff to get a good understanding of what their needs were, what their struggles were, what their long-term goals were, so that we could put together what we call a program of spaces, which would be a list of individual spaces and the needs of the department. And we'll look at that very specifically in just a moment. And then we looked at uh, how we could actually meet those needs and assign construction cost to those needs. So what we wanna do tonight is kind of walk through some of this information. Feel free to interrupt me anytime. I've got four kids at home, I'm used to it, so we'd be more than happy to, to stop and talk in detail about anything you see or hear. You're familiar with the existing facility. Uh, if you've been out there lately, you know that uh, they have added on or put out in front a little modular city. So that kind of speaks to the need without me saying a whole lot. The need is there, it's very critical. The site is a very tight site. Uh, you've got uh, a lot of land behind the station up to the road that's behind it, but it's also at a pretty good uh, slope. So it's not a very good uh, use for our uh, property to be able to try to build that direction. So with the existing building, with the existing modular, we do fill that site up pretty well. In looking at the facility, there's a lot of things we've noted. Uh, the items you see in red are really some of the very critical items, not that the items in black are not important, but uh, all of them really paint a picture of, of what we have out there. First of all, the building was built in 1980 with an addition in 1986. The combined square footage of the uh, existing and the original building is about 11,200 square feet to kind of give you that picture. Plus, and I don't know how many square feet we've added with the modulars, plus whatever that square footage is. So uh, just kind of walking through some of these things. And I'll look at all the red ones. I'm not going to try to read all of these just to uh, help with time, but I'll give you a copy of this when we finish. Uh, the biggest missing element with this fire station now, it was built in the 80s. Since the 80s, a lot of knowledge has been gained about contamination and cancer for firefighters. Everybody's heard the buzzwords, I'm sure, but it's been a critical change in how fire stations are designed in the last 40 or 50 years. What this station does not have is any of the decontamination and separation, what would be considered the norm today between where the fire trucks are parked and where the firefighters sleep. So just the quick education is when we think about a fire station, we think about a red zone, a yellow zone, and a green zone, hot, warm, and cool. Fire truck returning comes into the bay, that's the red zone. It is contaminated, the uh, equipment on it might be contaminated, the uh, fire uh, suits, the, the, <laughs> the gear, lose my words here, the, the gears is contaminated, and the firefighters themselves might have contaminants on them. So before they can enter then what we call the green zone, the living quarters, the dining areas, the sleeping areas, they must decontaminate it. So there's the spaces that separate those, which are the decon rooms and showers, areas for storing gear, uh, area for st storing the turnout gear, washing trucks, all of those spaces, they just simply don't exist. So that's probably one of the most critical elements we need to think about with this fire station and how it's currently designed. Uh, the, the second item or the third item on this list, and, and it's uh, very clear when you look out there, the uh, temporary modular bunk rooms have been added for two reasons. 
One is because of COVID, we have no separation of staff so that we can provide some safety for them, but we simply don't have any separation for gender also. The fire service has changed a tremendous amount again in 40 and 50 years, and the fact that we have so many female and uh, male firefighters trying to share the same spaces is a problem. So we have no uh, co-ed facilities. Number six, there is no fire sprinkler system in this building. That is a code requirement now. Anytime we have sleep rooms, you have to have sprinkler systems. Chief, I don't know if we're putting sprinklers in the modulars. <laughs> So uh, that, that's a critical element. Uh, number 12 down there, uh, the crews, not only uh, for the dormitory areas, we're sharing toilets and shower areas. We have what we call gang showers in there. We all remember back in high school where we were, took the uh, PE classes, we had the single uh, shower room. It's the same thing we have here. That's just not appropriate for today's standards. Number 15 and 16, the physical fitness area is in the bays, all the ex exercise equipment. Also, any training, they set up the chairs and the tables in the bay, because there is one, no room, and now number two, we're bringing all these people into what, again, it would be the red zone, the contaminated areas. This is not where we should have our exercise going on and our training going on. We have inadequate clearances for the vehicles in the bay. Sometime when all the vehicles are back in the bay, take a moment and walk around there, see how much room there is. It's not a lot of room. Non-code compliant drainage discharge from a gear washer. This is an interesting item. They have a gear washer to wash the gear. Nice big old PVC pipe comes out of the back and it spills onto the bay floor. So if you happen to be walking across the bay when that thing's emptying, you will get wet. It's a lot of water that comes out of these things. The electrical system is woefully inadequate for the building and the backup generator does not uh, cover the whole building, just portions of the building. So. A lot of other items that just need to have some uh, good thought put into them, it's just inadequate at this point. So, what do we need? Well, let me, let me just walk you through real quick. I forgot we got the pictures here. If you haven't been through the building, I would really encourage you to take a few minutes, get with the chief, and, and take a tour of it. It's, it's really good to understand what they have out here. So, you're looking at the front of the building here, the, the back of the building, and a quick shot of the modules that are being installed. One of the things you also note is there's a four foot grade change between the living areas and the bays. Not ideal when you're responding to a call at 3 a.m. in the morning, you've been woken up and you're trying to get to an ambulance or to a fire truck. The top three pictures of the offices, the only three offices in the building and report room, also all of them are small, lack of storage, lack of file space, they're, 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 they're problematic. You see the bunk, bunk room right here, day room and uh, kitchen here in the middle, and then uh, locker storage. So as, as you look through the building, you're gonna see it's very cramped, very tight. There's not a lot of space to be doing what needs to be done. I mentioned electrical. This is the main electrical room right amidst the washing machine and the dryer. So I've got uh, water going across electrical transformers and uh, switch gear, probably not the best thing to do. To get into the electrical room, you gotta go past the three shift refrigerators, which are not in the kitchen because there's not enough room in the kitchen. All of the bathrooms do not meet current uh, accessibility codes. Pretty dated. Uh, I mentioned the gymnasium, which is in the bays. Training, which is in the bays. Gear storage is in the bays. Turnout gear would never be stored in a bay now. You'd have a separate room that's ventilated to the outside. And just clearances. You cannot walk in front of the ambulance in the door. It's not a good idea. The gear washer I mentioned, you look at the PVC drain, it drains to right there. When that thing drains, it's gonna flush across that floor. And storage again. This is a shop and uh, supply storage. It's obviously full. So where do we go? And I'm not gonna try to go through every item on here. I'd be more than happy to, but uh, I don't wanna bore you to death. But what we have done is we've gone and met with the chief and his staff and looked at all the specific spaces that the fire department needs to make this work. You'll see two columns at the end, the first one and then a uh, second one with two different dates on them. The first one is where we started. And after we met with the chief, after looking at that, he said, guys, we, we can't do that. We need to cut this. So we went through an exercise with the chief and his staff and uh, started looking at some spaces that we could uh, eliminate and bring the cost down. 
So the first section you see here is what we call fire uh, vehicle bays. This is the, the areas of the bays, the, the decon rooms, the storage rooms for equipment and turnout gear, all of that part of the uh, fire department. And that equals 12,000 or 11,000 square feet, depending on uh, which one we're looking at. The next area of spaces are what we call the public spaces. So this is where the offices would be, where the training rooms would be, where the, all of these kind of spaces that the, any of the public might come into. So you've got a uh, lobby area, you've got offices, you see a number of offices that are crossed through here. These are spaces that the chief said, we would love to have those, but I just can't see the council wanting me to pay for that much more. So he's already done some cutting on this program. Uh, the storage, conference rooms, restrooms for the public, and then the size you see there at uh, two different uh, times. And then lastly is the private spaces. So these would be the spaces which make up what we think of as the living quarters for the firefighters. You see the day room in the kitchens and all the equipment that would be in those. You see the bunk rooms, several different kinds of bunk rooms, single toilet rooms and showers. So instead of having gang toilets and showers, you have a single room, you can close the door, you have a toilet, sink, you also have a shower, so everybody has a little privacy. It doesn't matter when you start designing stations this way what your gender ratio is. If there's no females, all the bunk rooms, all the restrooms can be used. If it's half and half, all the bunk rooms, all the restrooms can be used. So as that number changes, as that ratio changes, it doesn't impact the design of the building. So all of those spaces add up then, and then we have a, a final total there. Come around this side so I can get talk. Sorry for all the noise. Uh, where that gets us then is a total net square footage of about 19, just under 20,000 square feet for the building. On top of that, if you think about what a net square footage is, if you look in this room from wall to wall, front to back, side to side, that's our net square footage. But behind that uh, sheetrock, I've got the thickness of a wall. I might have a corridor. I might have a stair. I have the mechanical rooms. All of those spaces that support the space we're sitting in. So all of that is what we call the grossing spaces. So we have a net square footage, then we gross out the net square footage to become a total building need of 23,000, almost 24,000 square feet. Then we put dollars to that uh, for a low construction cost and a high construction cost, which if the whole facility was built new, so we took the existing building, demolished it, built new on the same site, or built new on a new site, then you would be costing between nine and $10 million. Now, one thing I'll caution you is, or actually a couple things I'll caution you. In today's uh, construction market, don't look at that low range. Six months ago, a year ago, we might be talking that. Don't even look at that today. A year from now, we'll see. I, I don't know where things will be that's changing so rapidly. The other thing is this is what we call the hard construction cost. So this is the bricks and the mortar, the labor, the materials, the contractor's fees, the permit costs. On top of that, you have architectural engineering fees, you have geotechnical evaluations, you have uh, contract costs, attorney's costs, FF&E, your furniture, fixtures, and equipment. That'll add 20 to 25% to it. So I'll show you those final numbers when we get through all of it. So that's where we started. Again, Chief and I met and we had a lot of conversation. He said, we've got to give the uh, city council some options because eight to $10 million is a lot of money and it's a lot more than we were thinking of. So we started looking at what can we save from the existing building. Really the best portions of that building are the bays. And that's the biggest portion, one of the biggest portions of this program of spaces. So we started looking at how we could save the bays. So the first option is what we just discussed we're going to go ahead and start from scratch and build everything new. You can see it's about $9 million to $10 million, depending on the low to high cost. Uh, what you see here is just a quick graphic of a bay layout, all new bays, how the equipment would fit in the bays, and then other equipment that the city has that would not fit in those bays. So we can build enough bays to fit all the equipment, but we didn't have to pay for it. So 
Chief and I have had a lot of conversations. This is the have to. So option one is uh, build new completely. Option two, and all the next options you'll see is demolishing the living quarters and the office area, building that new, and either renovating or adding on to or expanding the bays to some degree. So this option is extending and renovating the existing bays. And you can see that here. We have five existing bays. What you see hatched here and here is how the bays are certainly are, are currently setting back from each other. So if we expand the bays out the back for the first two bays, expand them out to the front in the uh, last three bays, we can get some uh, expanded bays, get some more room for his equipment. So if we renovate those bays, expand those bays, we can fit some of the equipment, not as much of the equipment as you saw from the previous slide, but our costs come down to about between $5 million and $6 million. That's a significant change, and we're, we're aware of that. The next option starts to get us a little more space. We're not extending any of the bays. You can see right here in the front, and you see here in the back, no extension, but we're adding a single bay. The living quarters, the offices, none of that's changed. The amount of renovation to the bays, the amount of addition to, uh, additions to the bays or extensions is what's changing. So now we go to uh, 5.5 million to six and a quarter. So can I ask you there, yes, sir. that additional bay is on that little piece of sloped land right at the edge of the property it would be next likely. to the new bays. Does any of this estimate take into account the runoff and grading? Because I know one of the big issues with that site is the, the runoff that goes behind, and that, that's part of that. Yeah, it, it, it's a general number we're using now. Okay. We, we don't have specifics of how we're going to design this or design that, but we, we have enough money there to deal with the site okay. issues. Now, could we decide that that bay, instead of being on the end, should be on this end, between what would probably be the existing bays and the new addition, right. certainly. There's nothing magical about that. Well, and can I pause you for one second? I'm gonna ask David this question. <clears throat> you may not know why. Um, I think there was a reason why we had to build the living quarters four feet higher. Is there something underneath there that won't allow us to dig deeper? That has been one of the biggest questions we've been yeah. trying to explore. We even went I, to the I want to say that when they were doing that, and again, you got to remember, I was just a little boy when this was going <laughs> on originally. There was some reason that they, they couldn't make it all one level. And so that's what I wonder. And of course, we've done no ground detection or anything right. to see if we're on a sla slab or anything there, because that whole parking lot and everything is on that same level, right? We even talked to some of the oldest uh, firefighters that we had, and nobody, nobody could remember. Know. Yeah. Right. And you know, one, the only thing that I've got out of, you know, both consistently is they wanted to keep the roof right away. Oh. Just, just whatever. whatever. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and we got to remember, this was not designed to be our primary fire station. This was an auxiliary fire station. It was never expected to have this capacity load on it because the main fire st station was on Main Street, and this was supplemental of that, so. Yeah, and everything that was done there was done very quickly yeah. after the fire, so uh, if you go out there and you look, you can see the property you're talking about yeah. next door. There was a low area, and yeah. so much of that was filled in yeah. and compacted when they did the addition in 86. 86, yeah. Uh, so there's been a number of things, because the firehouse is built under old code, and, and part of this process what we want to do and have Jim look at everything that we possibly need yeah. Uh, look at the old, look at the new, look at the tear down, look at the redo. So sure. We've done a great job. Of no, I appreciate it. All the, all the needs of, of the fire station. And, and please continue. I apologize for stopping no, you there, you're, but you're those fine. were two things that were on my mind but about the site. Specifically. And the other thing that's changed for the, for the council, uh, you all know that um, we took on EMS. Uh, yeah. Well, three, three years ago. <laughs> four. Uh, yeah. Oh, gosh. It's been four years. Yeah. Uh, so it's been four years, and, and when we did that, we was converting pretty quickly uh, as we moved away from the civilian contract to the new. So that's the other piece of this is trying to yep. bring in. And, and to your point, whether you stay on this site, which I think everybody's probably leaning towards based on our conversation, or you went to a new site, 
The first thing when you move forward is we're going to do a geotechnical yeah. analysis of the site. So there's going to be some cores dug through there. We're going to be looking at very specifically. Right. Is there a big hunk of rock there? Is there a uh, creek that flows under the ground there? All those things will need to be looked at. Because there's no sub-basement in there or anything, no. right? I mean, it no. literally is on a slab, and then you go down to another slab. That, you have a little four-foot retaining wall, which leaks. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, back to this, though. This third option is simply adding the bay and not doing any additions to the existing, not extending the existing bays. You're renovating them and adding a bay. And that takes you from five and a half to uh, six and a quarter. The fourth option is you do both. You extend the bays and you do an additional bay. So obviously this one would be the more expensive one. It's six million to uh, 6.7, but it gives you the most space and the least amount of vehicles we have to figure out what to do with still. Now the chief did say, okay, so if we are able to do that, can we put a pre-engineered uh, storage building behind the new renovation to accommodate some of these other vehicles? And then we did a cost for that to add, the difference on this one is adding a 30 by 40 prefab building at the rear, similar to what's already back there. There's some prefab buildings back there. And that brings your cost up to uh, six to uh, just basically $7 million. So th the most expensive short of building a new facility completely. Now to think about what it might look on site, and again, without any geotechnical uh, work and surveys and all that, does it fit? Yes. Uh, this was done before the modulars were there, so this would obviously change now. If, if you would say go ahead, what we'd probably end up doing is you would end up demolishing the existing living areas, and then instead of being this wide where your new addition is coming over top of the modulars, I would probably make it a little bit longer and try to keep those modulars in place during construction. Simply, we need a place for the crews to live while the work's being done. Then, it would be, the, the, the challenge would be once we have them moved is how do we do the bay extensions and uh, additions. So the addition on the bay could be done while the work on the offices and sleep areas is being done. Once all that's taken care of, then you just, the, the, the chief lives with the fact that he can only use the, these first two bays as back end bays for a while while we extend these and then uh, he probably turns his trucks around and comes out of the rear temporarily while you do an addition on the front of these to extend those. So it's just gonna take a lot of coordination between the design and the contractor to, to make it all work. Can it work on that site? Yes. Is it gonna be challenging? Certainly. So what you run in, uh, into doing is having a multi-phase project if we stay on the site. That can raise your cost some, because now the contractor has more general conditions because he's gonna be on site longer. And that can increase these costs a little bit more. So just kind of give you a picture of that. So what do these costs actually look at, like when you look at them all together? And I put this little chart together. It's uh, the first one in the same order you saw them, demolish and replace entire facility down to number five, including the little 30 by 40 prefab. The, columns you see on the end now are project costs. So these are the numbers you've been seeing are hard cost. Again, that's building the building in simple terms. Project costs are shown, it, these are actually 20% higher. You can count on it being 20 to 25% higher to include all the other costs of building a project. Because we can't ignore the fact that even though you're gonna $7 million building, it's gonna cost you more than $7 million by the time you're done. So. Looking at that, the first option is about $12,650,000. $12, number two is seven million. Number three is almost eight million. Number four is about eight and a half. And number five is 8700000 in round numbers. So, <laughs> I, I, presenting us with all those options, it's, um, Pretty I know heavy to think about. Chief, you know, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, how about that? <laughs> well, let me add in there, we're, we're all aware, because when we first started this, 
chief was saying, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking a two, maybe a $3 million project. Mm -hmm. And for all the reasons you've heard, it's, it's, it's not a two or $3 million project, and there's really no way you can truly get it down to that amount. I really think we thought it was going to be an extension maybe of the living quarters and uh, office space and, you know, cleaning some of that up and, and providing that. But I didn't realize how dire the situation was within the bays itself. I knew it was tight, and we knew that when we brought EMS back. I know that was one of the the hidden cost that was really there of doing that that we didn't address at the time, but. Absolutely. Well, um, one of the biggest questions that I have is, are we definitely dead set that this site is the very best possible site before we invest seven to twelve million dollars or something in that range in this location, or is that something we need to have a discussion about? The length of the debt. <laughs> yeah. Well, would the question be, though, if we built new, what would happen in the interim? Would we have to move to another site to build new, or would we be able to stage at the facility 
to tear down part and build, tear down part and build, and then combine it all together? We, we can definitely phase it, but at some point we have to do something with the trucks. Yeah. Because, you know, we can, we can demo the bays and build part of it and then move the staff, but we have to do something with those bays. Uh, so at some point the bays will have to come down and I don't have room on that site to place them, I don't think. Now, as I say that, if we look at where the modules are being uh, built now, right. if I put bays in front of those, they could be back in bays for now, and then you could uh, build those, then tear the bay, existing bays down, just living out the modules, which would be not fun, but doable, such that uh, later you tear the bays down, then add the office and uh, the, the bunk areas where the bays are now. What we would have to look at though is the traffic of how the trucks would come in mm -hmm. and now they'd be coming back out onto the main road there a lot closer to the intersection, mm -hmm. which is not ideal, but I don't know what the traffic count there would be an issue or not, Chief. Well, and the impact on the neighborhood too, that's the other thing that I'm concerned about. There are a lot of families that live right there. Um, yeah. What in a perfect world, there? I'd push everything down and just build it new, but yeah, what do we do, Chief, for a, a year with your staff and your vehicles? Well, Dave, you, you started to hit on one of my questions, which is, are any of these options particularly better suited for future growth than the others, or are all of them going to be just about equally capable of dealing as the new change in the stand? And, and truthfully stand on this site, you really are not set up for any future growth. You're, you're gonna be limited on that site. There's, there's no way around that. Uh, the, the ignoring money, which I know I can't, <laughs> but ignoring money, the best thing is to go to a new site, you build the new station, then they just you know, pick up over the weekend and move. Well, and here's what I wonder, because the initial building off of that, the initial plan when this was done was an east end substation a secondary substation somewhere, not to replace completely, but to provide those kinds of options and, and say there's a horrible situation on Wadsworth Street that you've got other places to go from, particularly since we know that significant growth may take place in the eastern portion of Bradford and the far western portion of Bradford. Um, that, that's a piece that I wonder, I've wondered about. And the other part that hasn't been considered, many communities are accomplishing this through public-private partnerships, trying to find folks who need to build facilities for other things, and a fire station component or an EMS component yeah. is added in as part of that. But do you want to? In, in general, your staff and your bays are gonna go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. If I'm adding staff, I'm adding vehicles because I have to have something for them to respond in or I'm adding a vehicle, then I have to have somebody actually drive that vehicle. So usually they go in hand in hand. So more, most communities, what we see is you'll build a station and then instead of expanding that station, you the build, as we were station. just discussing, the east or the west mm -hmm. or whatever the next station is. The challenge with that is that has more cost involved. Sure. If you can, if I can respond from one point, which we are doing now, that's certainly going to be more economical than building a two-third size station here and a one-third uh, size station over near the university. In fact, I can tell you, if we built a one near the university, you'd be looking at somewhere around three to you know four million dollars. Mm -hmm. So. That's a chunk of money that now I can't spend on the main station. Well, and I, you know, again. Is that Yes.
Not a lot of growth, though, because. Yeah, we've got six bunk rooms with two beds each, plus a bunk room with two bunk beds in it. So we do have some room for growth, but when you're looking at the COVID environment we have sure. now, you really don't want to be putting people in the beds, in the rooms together, if we can avoid it. And how many, how many people type beds do we have now? We currently have eight only two. So right now we have seven separate rooms. What questions do you have, Jesse? I, I guess one of the things that I was just kind of gleaning back to, um, I, and again, I'm kind of repeating what David had mentioned, but I know when we first started out, we, we weren't looking at a, at a total rebuild. We really were looking at um, getting another smaller location elsewhere. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm, I'm hearing $3 million and I'm trying to picture exactly the size of that because I'm, I'm not sure we expected it to be like half the size of our current building necessarily. Yeah, um, I think that's what it was gonna be. I think it was gonna be a, maybe a double bay and a small all operations, maybe cot area, but not anything to the elaborate the, nature right. of that. Yeah, the, I guess the first conversation we had about it, it the number wasn't quite at three million, if I remember correctly. We so. thought we could do the whole thing for two or three. <laughs> right. And so the other the other question that I have, you know, we're we're building a school and we have, you know, we're we're coming off the heels of COVID, and so you know, I'm always looking at, you know, how this council is indebting the city, you know, going forward into the future, and how other councils are going to have to uh, deal with decisions that we're making today. So in the bigger scheme of this project, if we go for the ideal approach, are there phases that we can do where we take on a phase and we have a three phase approach and we take on one and then, you know, and maybe leverage it that way through a larger amount of time? I think certainly. Uh, and the, the, the simplest would be a two phase approach okay. where you do either the bays and then we deal with the living quarters and the offices later or vice versa. Okay. That sets you up with a fairly straightforward and, and obvious uh, break point. Trying sense. to do it in three would probably get pretty challenging. Okay. But having said that, we have made a commitment now with these rented facilities for the living quarters. And until we address the living quarters issue, that rent, which is how much annually? Um, we start paying right. But that's an additional cost depending on how long we go. You know, if it's five years to get phase one done and then it's, you know, 10 years to get phase two, that's a lot of additional monies. How much is, did you say it is? It's something we haven't looked at to, just right now we just want to talk about ideas and this is not yet or something we're gonna be doing tomorrow. It's okay, how long do you think design Generally, you say design is six to eight months, and then construction roughly a year. So you're talking about a year from now, two years before the debt would, normally they talk about two and a half before the debt would kick in. Your school debt's dropping off substantially within two years. That does help you. We have not looked at any of the ARA, HRPA money mm -hmm. and how that's going to impact the local provision in the lease to fire facility. Uh, if that takes us out, And what did you say the cost was on those? They're uh, 7099 I think. I'll double check it in, in 60 years. That's monthly, though, right? Yeah, monthly. Yeah. So it's like $100,000 a year, essentially. So how much would it be to purchase those if we were going to use them, say, over a five- to eight-year period as we go through this process? Purchase price, if we think we're going to be two years, we might as well buy them. Right. 
Anything else, Jesse? No, that I, I was just trying to see if we could bite off smaller, <laughs> smaller pieces right now. Yeah, the problem we got into was that while we were, I, I guess nobody, you know, all of us, nobody knew the study shortfall of the 1980 building. Sure. Project. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you have question wise? Three questions. Um, what's the practical difference to the department between extending the bays and adding a bay? It's cheaper to extend it than to add it. It's simply I'm trying to take advantage of what infrastructure you have. Uh, if I extend it, I can get more vehicles in the bay, obviously, because it's, it's longer, but I've not solved some of the other issues of the width. Uh, the infrastructure actually in the bay, although they were updating some of that. So yeah, it's always better to have the correct width of a bay versus the narrower ones you have. But again, you, you work with what you have, and that's what I was trying to do. Right. So in theory, adding would be the better option than Oh, yeah. And let me throw a, a comment, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll say something the chief can't say, because you can throw me out. And, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, although I at home have to live on a budget, and I understand you have to live on a budget also, so we, we have to make some of these hard decisions. Do I build it all? Do I not build it all? It's going to be a challenging five whatever years for his staff if they're in those modulars both psychologically and just responding to a fire. So they got to move from a module outside and back into the bays and all that. It's not ideal and it's going to be a very challenging to recruit people when you have facilities like that for that length of time. So chief won't say that, I can say that, but I also realize just like you do, I live on a budget and you've got to be able to pay for what you're building. So I, I don't know where the answer is for you, but you know, it, it's not an easy one. Anything else for us? Uh, just a clarification, the, uh, the storage building was only mentioned for option five, but that could theoretically be added to any it, of the options. It could go on any of them, okay. right. That's about $250,000. Okay, that's all for me. Onassis, what do you got? Yeah, a couple questions. Uh, first, first is for David and the chief. So, I guess what percentage of the staffing is EMS versus firefighter? In terms of, you have eight per shift. Oh, both, both, oh, so dual, okay. Answers my second question. All right, so, um, and to you. And so if you were to back out the, if we chose a different site, how much demo cost would that knock off of the total project? Probably in the range of several hundred thousand dollars. Okay, so not, you know, 150 to 200. It's not huge then, okay. It's, it's, right. it's, a, it's a dollar amount, but it's not, 
yeah. a driving force. In a scale of $6 million, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. And, um, okay, yeah, so my only, con no, only concern is we know that the city's population is growing, so the capacity, I think uh, uh, Vice Mayor spoke to it earlier about needing more capacity to accommodate not only the growth of the city, but also that capacity for the firefighters to accommodate that growth. So that would be my only concern. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely a uh, sticky wicket, so yeah. Well, we kind of knew this was coming, just not at this level. And I mean, we've, we've gone on and, and grabbed the bull by the horns with doing the study and moving things forward. Because the city has known for decades that we were gonna need to address this in some way, shape, or form. I think the biggest challenge that we have is whatever we do is likely all, if, if we you know, go for the full renovation or the full rebuild, that's it for 30 years for facilities, physical bricks and mortar facilities for the most part. And what does that look like for Radford? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's the really, really hard piece of this because it's just like when we did the police station, that was kind of it for that 30 years. There'll be some small things that are done and certainly as equipment is needed, we'll address that. But um, it's a very similar situation. And um, I am glad of this. Uh, first and foremost, thank you to you chief and, and to all of your staff for all the hard work you do. Every time I talk with folks about their EMS service when they've had an emergency, um, they say, I can't believe how quick they got here. Uh, the response was amazing. I think they saved my you know, husband's life, my wife's life, whomever. And so you, what, what is happening is working and that's very good. And I think you know, the modular thing, while not ideal, was to try to be as immediate as possible yeah. to address the situation. Um, and then let us try to figure this out. I think it makes sense for us to maybe in the next couple of meetings have a full capital projects discussion with this through this lens and, and talk about that because I don't think this is something we can put off too long to make a decision about. Um, and it may be something that makes sense to have some sort of community forum, town hall discussion let folks come in and, and talk about it a little bit because this is a big investment, but this impacts every single citizen in the city of Radford um, and something we have to look at. Thank you so much for your presentation. Okay. Would it be possible for us to get a copy of the presentation um, for each of us? Because this is a lot to digest. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And uh, we may have some additional questions. If so, may we just filter them directly to you and um, we'll go from there? Yeah, if either Chief or Dave can get those to me. Okay, that sounds good. Anything else, folks, before we break for the, before we get into our regular meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll go on and take a 10 minute break and then reconvene in a few minutes.